The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising Yiddish, Wipstand in Wars W or GDA Polish, Powstanie W. Getki Warszawskim, German, Aufstand im Warschauer Ghetto was the 1943 act of Jewish resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto in German-occupied Poland during World War II to oppose Nazi Germany's final effort to transport the remaining ghetto population to Majdanek and Treblinka. After the Grossaktion Warsaw of summer 1942, in which more than a quarter of a million Jews were deported from the ghetto to Treblinka and murdered, the remaining Jews began to build bunkers and smuggle weapons and explosives into the ghetto. The left-wing Jewish combat organization Zob and right-wing Jewish military union formed and began to train. However, only the received logistical support from the similarly right-leaning Polish Home Army. A small resistance effort to another roundup in January 1943 was partially successful and spurred the Polish groups to support the Jews in earnest. The uprising started on 19 April when the ghetto refused to surrender to the police commander SS Brigadefuhrer Jürgen Stroop, who then ordered the burning of the ghetto, block by block, ending on 16 May. A total of 13,000 Jews died, about half of them burnt alive or suffocated. German casualties were probably less than 150, with Stroop reporting only 16 killed. Nevertheless, it was the largest single revolt by Jews during World War II. The Jews knew that the uprising was doomed and their survival was unlikely. Marek Edelman, the only surviving Zob commander, said that the motivation for fighting was to pick the time and place of our deaths. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, the uprising was one of the most significant occurrences in the history of the Jewish people. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Background. In 1939, German authorities began to concentrate Poland's population of over 3 million Jews into a number of extremely crowded ghettos located in large Polish cities. The largest of these, the Warsaw Ghetto, concentrated approximately 300,000 to 400,000 people into a densely packed, 3.3 square kilometers central area of Warsaw. Thousands of Jews died due to rampant disease and starvation under SS und Polizeifuhrer Odilo Globochnik and SS Standartenfuhrer Ludwig Hahn, even before the mass deportations from the ghetto to the Treblinka extermination camp began. The SS conducted many of the deportations during the Operation Code named Grossaktion Warschau, between 23 July and 21 September 1942. Just before the operation began, the German resettlement commissioner, SS Sturmbannführer Hermann Hoffel called a meeting of the Ghetto Jewish Council Judenrat and informed its leader, Adam Cherniakow, that he would require 7,000 Jews a day for the resettlement to the east. Cherniakow committed suicide once he became aware of the true goal of the resettlement plan. Approximately 254,000 to 300,000 ghetto residents met their deaths at Treblinka during the two month long operation. The gross action was directed by SS Oberfuhr Ferdinand von Samern Frankeneg, the SS and police commander of the Warsaw area since 1941. He was relieved of duty by SS und Polizeifuhrer Jürgen Stroop, sent to Warsaw by Heinrich Himmler on 17 April 1943. Stroop took over from von Samern Frankeneg following the failure of the latter to pacify the ghetto resistance. When the deportations first began, members of the Jewish resistance movement met and decided not to fight the SS directives, believing that the Jews were being sent to labor camps and not to their deaths. By the end of 1942, ghetto inhabitants learned that the deportations were part of an extermination process. Many of the remaining Jews decided to revolt. The first armed resistance in the ghetto occurred in January 1943. On 19 April 1943, Passover Eve, the Germans entered the ghetto. The remaining Jews knew that the Germans would murder them and they decided to resist to the last. While the uprising was underway, the Bermuda Conference was held from 19 to 29 April 1943 to discuss the Jewish refugee problem. Discussions included the question of Jewish refugees who had been liberated by Allied forces and those who still remained within German-occupied Europe. Topic: The uprising. Topic. January Revolt 
On 18 January 1943, the Germans began their second deportation of the Jews, which led to the first instance of armed insurgency within the ghetto. While Jewish families hid their so-called bunkers, fighters of the joined by elements of the Zob, resisted, engaging the Germans in direct clashes. Though the and Zob suffered heavy losses including some of their leaders, the Germans also took casualties, and the deportation was halted within a few days. Only 5,000 Jews were removed, instead of the 8,000 planned by Globochnik. Hundreds of people in the Warsaw Ghetto were ready to fight, adults and children, sparsely armed with handguns, gasoline bottles, and a few other weapons that had been smuggled into the ghetto by resistance fighters. Most of the Jewish fighters did not view their actions as an effective measure by which to save themselves, but rather as a battle for the honor of the Jewish people, and a protest against the world's silence. Preparations. Two resistance organizations, the and Zob, took control of the ghetto. They built dozens of fighting posts and executed a number of Nazi collaborators, including Jewish ghetto police officers, members of the fake German-sponsored and controlled resistance organization Zagyu, as well as Gestapo and Abwehr agents such as Judenrat member Dr. Alfred Nasig, executed on the 22nd of February 1943. The Zob established a prison to hold and execute traitors and collaborators. Josef Sharinsky, former head of the Jewish Ghetto Police, committed suicide. Topic: <inaudible> Main Revolt. On the 19th of April 1943, on the eve of Passover, the police and SS auxiliary forces entered the ghetto. They were planning to complete the deportation action within three days, but were ambushed by Jewish insurgents firing and tossing Molotov cocktails and hand grenades from alleyways, sewers, and windows. The Germans suffered 59 casualties and their advance bogged down. Two of their combat vehicles an armed conversion of a French-made Lorraine 37L light armored vehicle and an armored car were set on fire by the insurgents' petrol bombs. Following von Samern Frankenegg's failure to contain the revolt, he lost his post as the SS and police commander of Warsaw. He was replaced by SS Brigadefuhrer Jürgen Stroop, who rejected von Samern Frankenegg's proposal to call in bomber aircraft from Krakow and proceeded to lead a better organized and reinforced ground attack. The longest lasting defense of a position took place around the stronghold at Muranowski Square, where the chief leader, David Morik Apfelbaum, was killed in combat. On the afternoon of 19 April, a symbolic event took place when two boys climbed up on the roof of a building on the square and raised two flags, the red and white Polish flag and the blue and white banner of the These flags remained there, highly visible from the Warsaw streets, for four days. After the war, Stroop recalled, The matter of the flags was of great political and moral importance. It reminded hundreds of thousands of the Polish cause, it excited them and unified the population of the general government, but especially Jews and Poles. Flags and national colors are a means of combat exactly like a rapid-fire weapon, like thousands of such weapons. We all knew that, Heinrich Himmler, Kruger, and Hahn. The Reichsfuhrer Himmler bellowed into the phone, Stroop, you must at all costs bring down those two flags. During this fight on the 22nd of April, SS officer Hans Demke was killed when gunfire detonated a hand grenade he was holding. When Stroop's ultimatum to surrender was rejected by the defenders, his forces resorted to systematically burning houses block by block using flamethrowers and fire bottles, and blowing up basements and sewers. We were beaten by the flames, not the Germans, Edelman said in 2007. In 2003, he recalled. The sea of flames flooded houses and courtyards. There was no air, only black, choking smoke and heavy burning heat radiating from the red-hot walls, from the glowing stone stairs. The bunker wars lasted an entire month, during which German progress was slowed. While the battle continued inside the ghetto, Polish resistance groups AK and GL engaged the Germans between 19 and 23 April at six different locations outside the ghetto walls, firing at German sentries and positions. In one attack, three units of the AK under the command of Captain Józef Pesheny joined up in a failed attempt to breach the ghetto walls with explosives. 
Eventually, the lost all of its commanders and, on 29 April, the remaining fighters from the organization escaped the ghetto through the Muranowski Tunnel and relocated to the McCollin Forest. This event marked the end of significant fighting. At this point, organized defense collapsed. Surviving fighters and thousands of remaining Jewish civilians took cover in the sewer system and in the many dugout hiding places hidden among the ruins of the ghetto, referred to as bunkers by Germans and Jews alike. The Germans used dogs to look for such hideouts, then usually dropped smoke bombs down to force people out. Sometimes they flooded these so-called bunkers or destroyed them with explosives. On occasions, shootouts occurred. A number of captured fighters, especially the women, lobbed hidden grenades or fired concealed handguns after surrendering. There were also clashes between small groups of insurgents and German patrols at night. Stroop later recalled, May 1 was memorable for a number of reasons. I witnessed an extraordinary scene that day. A group of prisoners had been herded into the square. In spite of their exhaustion, many of them held their heads high. I stood nearby, surrounded by my escort. Suddenly I heard shots. A young Jew, in his mid-twenties I'd guess, was firing a pistol at one of our police officers. One. Dot two. Three. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 fast as lightning. One of the bullets hit the officer's hand. My men sprayed the Jew with fire. I managed to whip out my own pistol and hit him as he fell. As he lay dying, I stood over him, watching his life ebb away. On 8 May, the Germans discovered a large dugout located at Mila 18 Street, which served as Zob's main command post. Most of the organization's remaining leadership and dozens of others committed mass suicide by ingesting cyanide, including the chief commander of Zob, Mordishaj Anjelovich. His deputy Marek Edelman escaped the ghetto through the sewers with a handful of comrades two days later. On 10 May, a Bundist member of the Polish government in exile, Szmul Zygielboim, committed suicide in London to protest the lack of reaction from the Allied governments. In his farewell note, he wrote, I cannot continue to live and to be silent while the remnants of Polish Jewry, whose representative I am, are being murdered. My comrades in the Warsaw Ghetto fell with arms in their hands in the last heroic battle. I was not permitted to fall like them, together with them, but I belong with them, to their mass grave. By my death, I wish to give expression to my most profound protest against the inaction in which the world watches and permits the destruction of the Jewish people. The suppression of the uprising officially ended on 16 May 1943, when Stroop personally pushed a detonator button to demolish the Great Synagogue of Warsaw. Stroop later recalled, What a marvelous sight it was. A fantastic piece of theater. My staff and I stood at a distance. I held the electrical device which would detonate all the charges simultaneously. Jesuiter called for silence. I glanced over at my brave officers and men, tired and dirty, silhouetted against the glow of the burning buildings. After prolonging the suspense for a moment, I shouted, Heil Hitler and pressed the button. Besides claiming an estimated 56,065 Jews accounted for, although his own figures showed the number to be 57,065, and noting that, the number of destroyed dugouts amounts to 631. In his official report 24 May 1943, Stroop listed the following as captured booty. Sporadic resistance continued and the last skirmish took place on 5 June 1943 between Germans and a holdout group of armed Jews without connections to the resistance organizations. Casualties <coughs> 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 13,000 Jews were killed in the ghetto during the uprising some 6,000 among them were burnt alive or died from smoke inhalation. Of the remaining 50,000 residents, almost all were captured and shipped to Majdanek and Treblinka. Jürgen Stroop's internal SS daily report for Friedrich Kruger, written on 16 May 1943, stated 180 Jews, bandits and subhumans, were destroyed. The former Jewish quarter of Warsaw is no longer in existence. The large-scale action was terminated at 2015 hours by blowing up the Warsaw Synagogue. Total number of Jews dealt with 56,065, including both Jews caught and Jews whose extermination can be proved. Apart from eight buildings police barracks, hospital, and accommodations for housing working parties the former ghetto is completely destroyed. 
Only the dividing walls are left standing where no explosions were carried out. According to the casualty lists in Stroop's report, German forces suffered a total of 110 casualties 17 dead of whom 16 were killed in action and 93 injured, of whom 101 are listed by name, including over 60 members of the Waffen-SS. These figures did not include Jewish collaborators, but did include the Troniki men and Polish police under his command. The real number of German losses, however, may be well higher the Germans suffered about 300 casualties by Edelman's estimate. For propaganda purposes, the official announcement claimed the German casualties to be only a few wounded, while propaganda bulletins of the Polish underground state announced that hundreds of occupiers had been killed in the fighting. German daily losses of killed, wounded and the official figures for killed or captured Jews and bandits, according to the Stroop report, According to Raoul Hilberg, the number cited by Stroop 16 dead, 85 wounded cannot be rejected out of hand, but it is likely that his list was neither complete, free of errors, nor indicative of the German losses throughout the entire period of resistance, until the absolute liquidation of Jewish life in the ghetto. All the same, the German casualty figures cited by the various Jewish sources are probably highly exaggerated. Other historians such as Raoul Hilberg and French L. McLean endorse the accuracy of official German casualty figures. On the other hand, Stroop report vastly exaggerated actual losses and strength of the resistance. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was the largest single revolt by Jews during World War II. Topic: <laughs> Aftermath After the uprising was over, most of the incinerated houses were razed, and the Warsaw concentration camp complex was established in their place. Thousands of people died in the camp or were executed in the ruins of the ghetto. At the same time, the SS were hunting down the remaining Jews still hiding in the ruins. On 19 April 1943, the first day of the most significant period of the resistance, 7,000 Jews were transported from the Warsaw Ghetto to Treblinka extermination camp, where, purportedly, they developed again into resistance groups, and then helped to plan and execute the revolt and mass escape of 2 August 1943. From May 1943 to August 1944, executions in the ruins of the ghetto were carried out by Officers of the Warsaw SD facility and the security police, under the supervision of Dr. Ludwig Hahn, whose seat was located in Schutz Avenue. Paviak staff members. K.L. Warschau staff members. SS men from the 3rd Battalion of the 23rd SS Regiment and the police Battalion 3, SS Polizei Regiment 23, commanded by Major Otten Bunke, both open and secret executions carried out in Warsaw were repeatedly led by SS Obersturmfuhrer Norbert Berg Trips, SS Hauptturmfuhrer Paul Werner and SS Obersturmfuhrer Walter Witasik. The latter often presided over the police. Trio. Signing mass death sentences for Polish political prisoners, which were later pronounced by the ad hoc court of the security police in October 1943, Berkel was tried and condemned to death in absentia by the Polish resistance's special courts, and shot dead by the AK in Warsaw, a part of Operation Heads targeting notorious SS officers. That same month, von Samern Frankeneg was killed by Yugoslav partisans in an ambush in Croatia. Himmler, Globochnik and Kruger all committed suicide at the end of the war in Europe in May 1945. The general government governor of Warsaw at the time of the uprising, Dr. Ludwig Fischer, was tried and executed in 1947. Stroop was captured by Americans in Germany, convicted of war crimes in two different trials US military and, Polish, and executed by hanging in Poland in 1952 along with Warsaw Ghetto SS administrator Franz Konrad. Stroop's aide, Eric Steitman, was exonerated for minimal involvement. He died in 2010 while under investigation for war crimes. Sturmbannführer Hermann Hoffel who helped carry out the July 1942 Grossaktion Warsaw committed suicide after being arrested in 1962. Walter Bellwitt, who commanded a Waffen-SS battalion among Stroop forces, died on 13 October 1965. Han went into hiding until 1975, when he was apprehended and sentenced to life for crimes against humanity. He served eight years and died in 1986. 
SS Oberführer Arpad Wigand who served with von Samern Frankenberg as SS and police leader in Warsaw from 4 August 1941 to 23 April 1943 was tried for war crimes in Hamburg, Germany in 1981 and sentenced to 12.5 years in prison, died 26 July 1983. Walter Redder reportedly served in the SS Panzer Grenadier Training Battalion 3. He served a jail sentence in Italy from 1951 to 1985 for war crimes committed in 1944 in Italy, and died in 1991. Joseph Bloch was tried for war crimes and executed in 1969. Heinrich Klaustermeyer was tried for war crimes in 1965 and died in 1976. The Warsaw Ghetto Uprising of 1943 took place over a year before the Warsaw Uprising of 1944. The ghetto had been totally destroyed by the time of the general uprising in the city, which was part of the Operation Tempest, a nationwide insurrection plan. During the Warsaw Uprising, the Polish Home Army's Battalion Zoska was able to rescue 380 Jewish prisoners mostly foreign held in the concentration camp. Geschauka set up by the Germans in an area adjacent to the ruins of former ghetto. These prisoners had been brought from Auschwitz and forced to clear the remains of the ghetto. A few small groups of ghetto residents also managed to survive in the undetected bunkers and to eventually reach the Aryan side. In all, several hundred survivors from the first uprising took part in the later uprising mostly in non-combat roles such as logistics and maintenance, due to their physical state and general shortage of arms, joining the ranks of the Polish Home Army and the Armia Ludowa. According to Samuel Krakowski from the Jewish Historical Institute, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising had a real influence in encouraging the activity of the Polish underground. A number of survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, known as the Ghetto Fighters, went on to found the kibbutz Lohemi Hagatao, literally, Ghetto Fighters, which is located north of Acre, Israel. The founding members of the kibbutz include Yitzhak Zuckerman, Ichik Kukirman, who represented the Zob on the Aryan side, and his wife Zivia Lubikin, who commanded a fighting unit. In 1984, members of the kibbutz published Dafe Ejit, Testimonies of Survival. Four volumes of personal testimonies from 96 kibbutz members. The settlement features a museum and archives dedicated to remembering the Holocaust. Yad Mordecai, a kibbutz just north of the Gaza Strip, was named after Mordechaj Anyelovich. In 2008, Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff Gabi Ashkenazi led a group of Israeli officials to the site of the uprising and spoke about the events. Importance for IDF combat soldiers. In 1968, the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, Zuckerman was asked what military lessons could be learned from the uprising. He replied, I don't think there's any real need to analyze the uprising in military terms. This was a war of less than a thousand people against a mighty army and no one doubted how it was likely to turn out. This isn't a subject for study in military school. If there's a school to study the human spirit, there it should be a major subject. The important things were inherent in the force shown by Jewish youth after years of degradation, to rise up against their destroyers, and determine what death they would choose, Treblinka or uprising. On 7 December 1970, West German Chancellor Willy Brandt spontaneously knelt while visiting the monument to the Ghetto Heroes Memorial in the People's Republic of Poland. At the time, the action surprised many and was the focus of controversy, but it has since been credited with helping improve relations between the NATO and Warsaw Pact countries. Many people from the United States and Israel came for the 1983 commemoration. <laughs> Opposing forces Jewish Two Jewish underground organizations fought in the Warsaw Uprising, the left-wing Zydowska Organizacja Bojowa Zob, founded in July 1942 by Zionist Jewish youth groups within the Warsaw Ghetto, and the right-wing Zydowski Zwiazek Waskowi or Jewish Military Union, a national organization founded in 1939 by former Polish military officers of Jewish background which had strong ties to the Polish Home Army, and cells in almost every major town across Poland. 
However both organizations were officially incorporated into the Polish Home Army and its command structure in exchange for weapons and training. Marek Edelman, who was the only surviving uprising commander from the left-wing ZOB, stated that the ZOB had 220 fighters and each was armed with a handgun, grenades, and Molotov cocktails. His organization had three rifles in each area, as well as two land mines and one submachine gun. Due to its socialist leanings, the Soviets promoted the actions of ZOB as the dominant or only party in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, a view often adopted by secondary sources in the West. The right wing faction, which was founded by former Polish officers, was larger, more established, and had closer ties with the Polish resistance, making it better equipped. Zimmerman describes the arms supplies for the uprising as limited but real. Specifically, Jewish fighters of the received from the Polish Home Army, two heavy machine guns, four light machine guns, 21 submachine guns, 30 rifles, 50 pistols, and over 400 grenades for the uprising. During the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, is reported to have had about 400 well-armed fighters grouped in 11 units, with four units including fighters from the Polish Home Army. Due to the U's anti-socialist stand and close ties with the Polish Home Army which was subsequently outlawed by the Soviets, the Soviets suppressed publication of books and articles on, after the war and downplayed its role in the uprising, in favor of the more socialist ZOB. More weapons were supplied throughout the uprising, and some were captured from the Germans. Some weapons were handmade by the resistance, sometimes such weapons worked, other times they jammed repeatedly. Shortly before the uprising, Polish Jewish historian Emanuel Ringelblum who managed to escape from the Warsaw Ghetto, but was later discovered and executed in 1944 visited a armory hidden in the basement at 7 Muranowska Street. In his notes, which form part of Oneg Shabbat archives, he reported They were armed with revolvers stuck in their belts. Different kinds of weapons were hung in the large rooms, light machine guns, rifles, revolvers of different kinds, hand grenades, bags of ammunition, German uniforms, etc., all of which were utilized to the full in the April. Action! While I was there, a purchase of arms was made from a former Polish army officer, amounting to a quarter of a million zloty, a sum of 50,000 zloty was paid on account. Two machine guns were bought at 40,000 zloty each, and a large amount of hand grenades and bombs. Due to the nature of the conflict and that it took place within the confines of German-guarded Warsaw Ghetto, the role of the Polish Home Army was primarily one of ancillary support, namely, the provision of arms, ammunition and training. Although the Home Army's stocks were meager, and general provision of arms limited, the right wing received significant quantities of armaments, including some heavy and light machine guns, submachine guns, rifles, pistols and grenades. Polish The Polish Home Army also disseminated information and appeals to help the Jews in the ghetto, both in Poland and by way of radio transmissions to the Allies, which fell largely on deaf ears. During the uprising, the Polish resistance units from the Polish Home Army and the Communist Guardia Ludowa attacked German units near the ghetto walls and attempted to smuggle weapons, ammunition, supplies, and instructions into the ghetto. Their failure to break through German defenses limited supplies in the ghetto which was otherwise cut off from the outside world by a German-ordered blockade. In mid-April at 4 a.m., the Germans began to liquidate the Warsaw Ghetto, closed down the remnants of the Jews with a police cordon, went inside tanks and armored cars and carried out their destructive work. We know that you help the martyred Jews as much as you can, I thank you, my countrymen, on my own and the government's behalf, I am asking you to help them in my own name and in the government, I am asking you for help and for extermination of this horrible cruelty. The command of the Home Army ordered to Kediv carried a series of actions around the walls against the German units under code name Ghetto Action. Between 19 and 23 April 1943, the Polish resistance engaged the Germans at six different locations outside the ghetto walls, shooting at German sentries and positions and in one case attempting to blow up a gate. The Polish Home Army fought in four units with the, in Muranowska Street having climbed into the ghetto via secret tunnels dug by the a National Security Corps unit commanded by Henryk Ivansky. Bystry reportedly fought inside the ghetto along with, and subsequently both groups retreated together including 34 Jewish fighters to the so-called Aryan side. Several Zob commanders and fighters also later escaped through the tunnels with assistance from the Poles and joined the Polish underground home army. 
From April 24, daily patrols against Germans near the ghetto, aimed at eliminating the Germans and training our own home army branches up to now without own losses. Some Germans were eliminated every day. Participation of the Polish underground in the uprising was confirmed by a report of the German commander Jürgen Stroop, who wrote, when we invaded the ghetto for the first time, the Jews and the Polish bandits succeeded in repelling the participating units, including tanks and armored cars, by a well-prepared concentration of fire. The main Jewish battle group, mixed with Polish bandits, had already retired during the first and second day to the so-called Muranowski Square. There, it was reinforced by a considerable number of Polish bandits. Its plan was to hold the ghetto by every means in order to prevent us from invading it, Time and again Polish bandits found refuge in the ghetto and remained there undisturbed, since we had no forces at our disposal to comb out this maze. One such battle group succeeded in mounting a truck by ascending from a sewer in the so-called Prosta street, and in escaping with it about 30 to 35 bandits. The bandits and Jews, there were Polish bandits among these gangs armed with carbines, small arms, and in one case a light machine gun, mounted the truck and drove away in an unknown direction. On the other hand, despite German evidence of Polish fighters joining the struggle, some survivors have reported different experiences. In her book On Both Sides of the Wall, Vladka Mead, who was a member of the left-wing Zob, devoted a chapter to the insufficient support from the Polish resistance. Indeed, records confirm that the leftist Zob received less weaponry and no fighters from the Polish Home Army, unlike the right-wing, with whom the Home Army had close ties and ideological similarities. However, both Vladka and Benjamin Mead were eventually rescued from the ghetto by a Polish man who risked his life by transporting them both out of the danger zone covered up with burlap inside his wagon, and bandaged Benjamin's head wound. <laughs> German Ultimately, the efforts of the Jewish resistance fighters proved insufficient against the German occupation system. According to Hannah Kral, the German task force dispatched to put down the revolt and complete the deportation action numbered 2,090 men armed with a number of minethrowers and other light and medium artillery pieces, several armored vehicles, and more than 200 machine and submachine guns. Its backbone consisted of 821 Waffen-SS paramilitary soldiers from five SS Panzergrenadier Reserve and Training Battalions and one SS Cavalry Reserve and Training Battalion. The other forces were drawn from the Orningspolizei Orpo Order Police battalions from the 22nd and 23rd Regiments, Warsaw personnel of the Gestapo and the Sicherheitsdienst SD Intelligence Service, one battalion each from two Wehrmacht here Railroad Combat Engineers Regiments, a Wehrmacht battery of anti-aircraft artillery, a detachment of multinational commonly but inaccurately referred to by the Germans and Jews alike as Ukrainians, ex-Soviet POW, Troniki Manor. Auxiliary camp guards trained by the SS Todinkofferbande at Troniki Concentration Camp, and Technical Emergency Corps. Several Gestapo jailers from the nearby political prison Paviak, led by Franz Berkel, volunteered to join the hunt for the Jews. A force of 363 officers from the Polish police of the general government so-called Blue Police was ordered by the Germans to cordon the walls of the ghetto. Warsaw Fire Department personnel were also forced to help in the operation. Jewish policemen were used in the first phase of the ghetto's liquidation and subsequently summarily executed by the Gestapo. Stroop later remarked, I had two battalions of Waffen-SS, 100 army men, units of order police, and 75 to 100 security police people. The security police had been active in the Warsaw Ghetto for some time, and during this program it was their function to accompany SS units in groups of six or eight, as guides and experts in ghetto matters. By his own words, Stroop reported that after he took command on 19 April 1943 the forces at his disposal totaled 31 officers and 1,262 men. Stroop's report listed ultimate forces at his disposal as 36 officers and 2,054 men. His casualty lists also include members of four other Waffen SS training and reserve units 1st SS Panzer Grenadier, 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier, 4th SS Panzer Grenadier, 5th SS Panzer Grenadier training battalions. Polish police came from the Commissariats 1st, 7th and 8th. There is also evidence that German police of the SSPF of Lubin took part in the liquidation of the Warsaw Ghetto Jews.
Topic: Controversy. Already during the war the influence and the importance of the right-leaning Jewish underground organization Zydowski Zwiazek Waskowi or Jewish Military Union was being downgraded. The surviving commanders of the leftist Zob either did not mention the Uz fight in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in their writings at all, or belittled its importance. Also the wartime Soviet propaganda did only briefly mention the fighters as they collided with its aims of presenting the Soviet Union as the only defender of the European Jewry. In addition, except for David Wadowinski none of the high-ranking commanders of the survived the war to tell their part of the story and it was not until 1963 that Wadowinski's memoirs were published. This led to a number of myths concerning both the and the uprising being commonly repeated in many modern publications. This was even strengthened by the post-war propaganda of the Polish communists, who openly underlined the value of the leftist Zob, while suppressing all publications on the Polish Home Army backed in recent years, new research by historians Dariusz Libyanka Poland and Lawrence Weinbaum Israel on the has called into question the validity of what has been written on the revisionist Zionist underground that fought in the ghetto. Their monograph Bohaterowi, Hoxtepleje, Opiziwaz cast new light on some of the Polish and Jewish accounts retold by those who wrote about the revolt. Over the years these testimonies found their way into many secondary sources, both popular and scholarly works by other authors, as well as reference books. The research by Libyanka and Weinbaum attempted to deconstruct and discredit the testimony of Henrik Ivansky and two others who claimed to have fought in the ranks of the organization or aided it. Libyanka and Weinbaum maintain that David Morik Apfelbaum, who is often credited with having played a commanding role in the and after whom a square was named in Warsaw, was in all likelihood an entirely fictitious figure, a product of falsica political forgery. Nevertheless, the stories of Apfelbaum and Ivansky as heroic combatants of the ghetto continued to be the focus of commemorations. In Israel, on the 70th anniversary of the uprising, a new edition of the 1963 book on the, written by Chaim Lazar Litte was published, and retold the story of Ivansky's and Apfelbaum's commanding role in the the retired Israeli politician Moshe Ahrens, who has also written widely on the and the Warsaw Ghetto, contributed a foreword to the new edition. In popular culture The uprising is the subject of numerous works, in multiple media, such as Alexander Ford's film Border Street 1948, John Hearst's novel The Wall 1950, Leon Uri's novel Mila 18 1961, Jack P. Eisner's autobiography The Survivor 1980, Andre Vida's films A Generation 1955, Samson 1961, and Holy Week 1995, and John Avnet's film Uprising 2001. It was also portrayed in Marvin J. Chomsky's NBC miniseries Holocaust 1978 and Roman Polanski's film The Pianist 2002 based on 1946 reprinted 1999 Warsaw Ghetto Survivor Memoir The Pianist Memoir by Władysław Spilman. The revolt was briefly featured in the fantasy film Highlander 1986, as well as in the novel Highlander, Zealot 1997 and the video game Velvet Assassin 2009. Joe Kubert's graphic novel Yassel imagines the conflict. Songs about the uprising include Hirsch Glick's Zog Nit Keen Mole, written in 1943, Johnny Clegg's Warsaw 1943, and David Rovick's I Remember Warsaw. The photograph of a boy surrendering outside a bunker became one of the best-known photographs of World War II and the Holocaust, and he is said to represent all six million Jewish Holocaust victims. See also List of victims and survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto Sobibor Uprising Bialystok Ghetto Uprising Ghetto uprising equals equals notes <laughs>